Thank you everyone for coming to the event today. Um, it's nice to see everyone committed to some causes and taking some time out of their busy day to listen to these two amazing speakers. Um, so I heard a short introduction on both speakers and we'll start with Terrence J. Evans. He's a partner at the San Francisco and Los Angeles office for Dwayne Morris, uh, where he serves as the co-leader of the firm's banking and financial service practice. Uh, Mr. Evans graduated from Cornell University, made multiple appearance on the Dean's List, and was a Cornell Tradition Fellow. He also graduated from Loyola Law School in Los Angeles with recognition and was ranked the third best oral advocate in the United States at the Frederick, Frederick Douglass Moot Court Competition. His practice is focused on representing clients in federal and state trial and appellate courts across the United States, including the United States Supreme Court. Uh, Mr. Evans also regularly counsels clients regarding racial justice, diversity, and inclusion, uh, inclusion issues. Uh, he has led dozens of diversity trainings for judges, lawyers, law students, and members of the community around the United States. Uh, Mr. Evans is president of the Charles Houston Bar Association, California's oldest black bar association. Uh, Mr. Evans has spoken at more than 150 diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and civil rights programs in partnership with more than 50 law schools, bar associations, colleges, universities, high schools, law firms, churches, and other organizations. Uh, Recently, in 2021, Mr. Evans was honored by the Bar Association of San Francisco and Justice and Diversity Center for his diversity and inclusion work in Northern California throughout the United States. And um, more recently, in our community, uh, Mr. Evans attended the Reparations Symposium here at SEU Law um, and imparted to this community a moving speech that is still discussed, admired, and reflected here in Charney Hall. Um, and then our second speaker, uh, currently a staff attorney and a policy liaison, with the Northern California Innocence Project, Melissa O'Connell. Uh, she received her JD at Santa Clara Law in 2003. She graduated with a public interest um, certificate. She served several years as a deputy public defender in Solano County, represented indigent clients charged with various misdemeanor and felony, felony level offenses. Um, Melissa was one of the early practitioners with a fresh life for youth, a legal nonprofit working with at risk youth in Santa Clara County. Um, with that trial experience, Ms. Lee joined a, Melissa joined a boutique criminal defense firm in Berkeley, California, and practiced in multiple jurisdictions throughout Northern California. Uh, in January 2010, Melissa returned to this community, Santa Clara School of Law, uh, where she currently serves as a staff attorney and policy liaison for NCIP, uh, where she litigates cases for wrongful conviction, supervises clinical law students, and lobbies and testifies in Sacramento for legislative reform inspired, inspired by innocence work. Her caseloads focus on claims of innocence involving DNA evidence. And then as a lecturer in law, uh, Melissa's taught courses in legal analysis. She was my legal analysis professor, uh, advanced legal writing, interviewing counseling, and introduction in U.S. law, and served as a coach for juvenile external honors moot court competition. Uh, more importantly, she's a fantastic mentor and a foundational pillar at SU Law, educating students to achieve any success of success or any uh, Educating students to achieve any definition of definition of success they aspire for. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the um, uh, very kind introduction. And I will go ahead and begin. And I want to take a moment to uh, uh, thank Professor Averill and also. Uh, give a shout out to my friend, uh, Professor Deborah Moss West, uh, and all the wonderful people there at Santa Clara uh, Law School. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, if I may, um, and just go over a few slides that I think will help illustrate the point of what we're discussing today. And I, I want to just emphasize how important it is for us to have this discussion and how grateful I am that we are having this discussion. Uh, over the past uh, nearly four years, I've been giving a number of these presentations. Uh, most recently, over the past three years, I've been doing this training for the California Supreme Court, all of their clerks, all of the justices of the California Courts of Appeal throughout uh, the state and their, and their clerks and many of the trial courts um, and federal courts as well. Uh, going back, if I may, to uh, May of 2021, uh, I started noticing that there was a, 
uh, backlash, if you will, to having discussions about race, diversity, and inclusion. And in May of 2021, that's only two years ago, uh, we were up to about 14 states that were limiting the kind of discussion that we're having today. Uh, June 2021, it was about 21 states. Um, October 2021, we were up to about 28 states. And as of today, we are up to uh, nearly 36 states throughout the United States that have placed very strict limitations on this type of discussion. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, some of the news coverage uh, about this. Uh, in some states, it's actually been criminalized. So Kentucky, for example, if a public school teacher were to share the information that I'm sharing with you today, uh, they would be arrested, they would be fired, uh, their lives and careers turned upside down. Same thing happened in Florida and many places across the middle and southern parts of the state. But as you see, it's a pretty widespread. Um, so we're fortunate that we can have this discussion. There is some positive news in 17 states, which is not anywhere close to half of the country. Uh, there, are, there are movements in the opposite direction uh, where they're expanding access to this kind of uh, discussion. Uh, and so for my presentation, I'm going to focus a lot on uh, systemic racism in California, uh, and it will really set up the uh, discussion that we have about the issues that are presently facing our great state. Um, and I'm going to begin with slavery, and people may wonder why am I going back so far. In order to really conceptualize and understand the, the struggles that we're having today, it's important to have that historical context. I'm going to go through this fast because I know we only have a limited amount of time for this discussion, but I will make my slides available uh, to folks who want to look at this in more detail, and you're always free to call or email me uh, to have further discussion, but slavery in the United States began in approximately 1539. I'm, I'm very familiar with the popular 1619 project, uh, but slavery began in what is now Florida back in 1539. Uh, it was the uh, result of an edict from Spain's king, uh, which set this whole process in motion. Um, it's no secret that slavery helped to build the economy of what was the colonies and what became the United States of America. It was the British who brought us colonial um, plantation slavery. Uh, that was something that the Brits provided to the United States, uh, which was extremely profitable, multi-billion dollar industry. Um, if folks want to understand how did slaves get to the United States, it was not a luxurious journey. Uh, these uh, pictures, these descriptions uh, that are reflected on this slide shows that uh, slaves were packed in as sardines, essentially, chained, uh, forced to lie in their own feces and urine for months. Many got sick. When they got sick, they were thrown overboard. Uh, those slaves who did make it to the United States were treated as property. Uh, and this is a bill, uh, this is a, an advertisement, rather, showing slaves uh, being offered for sale, men, women, uh, girls, boys, uh, and this is how people would find out about that process. You would have slave auctions uh, where families were separated. And in this particular uh, drawing, we see a mother being separated from her daughter at a slave auction. They were inspected. Uh, so it was very difficult and traumatic uh, for those people who had to uh, go through that experience. This is another example of a slave auction uh, where you would have uh, potential buyers inspecting what was going to be their property. The very first police interactions between Black people and uh, law enforcement in this country had to do with slave patrols. So the very first law enforcement and the very uh, purpose of law enforcement initially was to prevent slaves uh, from escaping, to track them down, to return them to uh, their owners. Um, and then following that, uh, the, the work of law enforcement was to enforce Jim Crow laws. This is an example of what the, uh, the oath was that many of the law enforcement officers would take. And essentially their goal was to uh, maintain order and uh, preserve the property uh, of those slave owners. 
the laws that were in place during that time period that placed limitations on the civil rights of Blacks and other people of color uh, were often referred to as Black codes. And we're going to specifically look at uh, California's uh, laws that place these types of limitations, because I think some people have the misimpression uh, that this was a Southern problem, uh, but it was actually very much a California problem. And this is an example of what some of those were. We're going to get into some specifics uh, when we turn to uh, California. Uh, but again, when we try to understand why there has been this tension that we're all aware of, whether it's George Floyd or Rodney King or any of the other more recent examples of African-Americans having this uh, very uh, difficult relationship and other people of color with law enforcement, it goes all the way back to slavery and uh, Jim Crow. Uh, as we uh, made it through the uh, process of ending slavery, uh, part of the way that the North was able to get uh, African-Americans to uh, join their ranks was through this Confiscation Act. Uh, and essentially the Union troops seized uh, those African-Americans who were willing to obviously put their lives on the line to fight for freedom. Uh, the very first a uh, soldier who died uh, during the Civil War uh, happened to be Black. Um, this was the, the way in which they did it. This is a picture of formerly enslaved people uh, trying to get themselves uh, acclimated into American society. So I'm now going to turn my attention to California specifically, because again, I think many people don't know the true history of California. Uh, and what that experience was like for people of color. And this was an example of, of, of signs that were up uh, around the founding of California. California, of course, uh, became a state in 1850. Uh, it was the 31st state, and this was the very first governor of California, Peter H. Burnett. Uh, he was born in Tennessee. He was a segregationist, and he made it his mission uh, to keep as many people of color out of California as possible. And he was directly responsible uh, for many of the very first Jim Crow laws that we had in California that were in effect uh, for 100 plus years. These are some examples uh, based on my review of history of Jim Crow laws that were enacted in California uh, around the founding of the state in 1850, uh, all the way through in many cases, the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. These laws in the great state of California barred non-whites from testifying in any case where a white person was a party. And we're gonna get into some very specific uh, cases as examples, uh, barred non-whites from serving on a jury. When we talk about a jury of our peers and being represented as part of the uh, system, uh, there were laws that limited uh, that in California. Uh, we had laws here in the great state of California that limited non-whites from voting, from holding elective office, from serving as judges, barred non-white attorneys from questioning white witnesses. Many people are unaware of this fact, but if you looked like me uh, during the first hundred years plus, uh, there were many places in California where you could not question a white witness or you could ask a question, but they did not have to answer. This was changed first in the federal system uh, before California uh, got with the program and became a bit more inclusive. Uh, barred non-whites from public schools, that happened right here in California. Barred non-whites from buying and renting property. When we talk about redlining and limiting communities to certain areas, it was done intentionally. So you wonder why were there Black communities and Asian communities and Hispanic communities? It wasn't simply because people wanted to be around people who looked like them and enjoyed some of the same cuisine and music. They, they were limited uh, from moving uh, to other neighborhoods. You could not get a loan. There were specific codes on and uh, enforce that limited uh, people of color. In California, barred non-whites from being buried in uh, certain cemeteries. Uh, so the cemeteries were segregated. So even in death in California, there were only certain places you could be buried. Uh, in California, barred non-whites from restaurants, hotels, theaters, pools, hospitals, and beaches. I think hospitals is probably one of the most egregious because people are just unaware of how systemic 
and widespread the discrimination was in California. And this was all throughout the United States, but in California. So if you were a person of color and you were in an accident, you had a heart attack, you had a stroke, you were having a baby, you could not just go to any hospital in California. You could only go to a hospital that served people of color. And if that happened to be 50 miles away, 100 miles away, and you couldn't make it in time or you didn't have transportation to get there, you just died. And that's how it was in the great state of California. Uh, denied non-whites admission to bar associations. So I'm currently the director of Region 9 of the National Bar Association, um, which means that I help to represent all Black bar associations and judicial organizations in the Western U.S., the National Bar Association is the umbrella for all Black bars uh, in the world. The reason why it exists is because Black lawyers and Asian lawyers and Hispanic lawyers were denied admission to the American Bar Association and local county bar associations because of the color of their skin. Bar non-whites from public transportation, equal pay, equal work, um, prohibited. Uh, marriages between whites and people of color. I want to quickly get to uh, some examples of um, uh, two cases that many people are unaware that are part of our California uh, jurisprudence. Uh, the first being People versus Hall. Uh, this was an opinion that was written by uh, what was the youngest and still the youngest ever Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court. Uh, this is Justice Hugh C. Murray, and you see his picture here, kind of has this interesting triangular uh, hairdo, uh, became uh, Chief Justice at only 27 years old. Uh, and in People versus Hall, you had a situation where uh, a white man murdered an Asian man of Chinese descent. There were numerous Asian witnesses who saw what happened, who were prepared to testify what happened, and actually did testify uh, this white man was uh, was convicted and he was sentenced to death. He was going to be um, uh, executed for what he did. Uh, however, his defense lawyers appealed because there was a statute on the book in the great state of California. It was a Civil Practice Act uh, 394. And, and basically it held that um, any person who was of uh, Negro or Indian descent uh, could not give evidence or testify against a white person. And so the issue was, how are we going to treat Asian people? Are we going to treat them like white people and give them the opportunity to offer testimony? You have numerous people who witness this murder. Or are we going to treat them like Black people and say that they are deemed incompetent because of the color of their skin and they can't testify? Long story short, the California Supreme Court, uh, in this opinion written by uh, Justice Murray, uh, concluded that the terms Indian, Negro, Black, White, they're all generic terms, uh, and essentially decided that Asian people were going to be treated like Black people, and they were not going to be able to offer testimony, and this man, who numerous folks witnessed commit this murder, uh, was let go uh, free. Uh, and, and so there was a huge uprising in the Asian community in California at the time, even though this was 1854, you had a number of Asian business uh, folks and civil rights leaders, and they said, you know what, there's just no way we're going to stand for this. Uh, they appealed to the California legislator, they protested, they appealed to the governor. They said, you know what, you are not going to treat uh, Asian people this way in the great state of California. Uh, but of course, this was not 2023, and there was a backlash against the Asian community, and the California legislature decided not only uh, do we support this horrific decision that prevents uh, Asian people and other people of color from testifying in criminal cases, uh, they expanded it uh, to include civil cases. So this made it possible in the great state of California for people to do whatever they wanted to people of color, and those people of color could not challenge it uh, in civil court. Uh, so you could go and you could steal something. You could uh, you could take somebody's house. This happened in a number of cases. You could say, you know what, you got a really nice house. I like it. It's my house. I'm going to take it. You could do whatever you wanted. Uh, personal injury didn't matter. There was no way for people of color to defend themselves. Another 
uh, infamous case in our wonderful California jurisprudence, People versus Aaliyah. And in this case, uh, you had a, a white criminal defendant also convicted of murder. But the difference here was the witness was a Turkish uh, gentleman uh, who had Caucasian features but dark skin. And so the California Supreme Court had to decide, how do we treat someone who looks Caucasian, but they have dark skin? Is it the color of their skin that makes them incompetent to testify? Is it some other feature? And so there was discussion and, and there were folks who were a bit concerned because, you know, if you go out and you get a nice suntan during the summer on the beach, are you going to lose your white privilege and be deemed incompetent? So the California Supreme Court decided that it wasn't just the color of someone's skin, it was also their features. Because of course you have light-skinned Blacks and light-skinned Asians and light-skinned Hispanics. So we can't just make it about skin color, it has to be something more. So you have to, according to the California Supreme Court, have this perfect combination of Caucasian features uh, and light skin, uh, and the court will do this balancing test to decide whether or not you have the right to offer evidence, uh, but simply having darker skin, if you have the right features, uh, will not uh, result in you uh, being incompetent. There's just a couple of other details that I want to share, and I know we need to get into some of the more modern aspects, but I think it's important to uh, uh, cover some of this uh, this history. Uh, and we're going to just talk a little bit about uh, reparations and what that term means uh, and some other ugly parts of uh, California history. So uh, reparations, I know there's a reparations task force uh, that Governor Newsom has set up to study uh, the extent to which uh, people of color in this particular instance, the African-American community, uh, should uh, receive any sort of um, uh, payment, if you will, for for pass uh, injustice. I was actually on ABC7 Bay Area talking about this uh, just last week. Uh, so there is a history of the United States paying reparations. Uh, some were paid to the Native American uh, community, not enough, of course, uh, for the genocide against that community, uh, but billions of dollars in uh, reservations and so forth were, were paid uh, to uh, Japanese Americans, um, uh, who were interred uh, un unjustly uh, during World War II, uh, victims of the Holocaust, and so on. Uh, but that has never happened uh, for the African-American uh, community. And, and there has been discussion over the years, going all the way back uh, to the end of slavery in our 1860s, uh, President Abraham Lincoln had discussions with uh, members of the Black community about possibly providing 40 acres and a mule. And I'm sure many of you have heard about this. Unfortunately, with the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, uh, the, the reparations that were going to be paid uh, died with Lincoln. Uh, he had a more conservative uh, vice president, Andrew Johnson, who decided that instead of giving uh, these former slaves who had no property, no land, no education, nothing, uh, at least some basic uh, support so that they could get themselves acclimated to American society. Instead, they paid reparations to the slave owners. And the theory was that the slave owners were losing property. Uh, and so to help uh, these slave owners uh, get themselves uh, uh, better situated, uh, they paid reparations to the slave owners. So nothing uh, at all for the slaves. And many of the slaves were essentially forced back into a new form of slavery, which was sharecropping. Uh, my grandparents on my mother's side were sharecroppers, as were their parents and their parents. Essentially, the slaves had nowhere to go. And so they returned back to the plantation uh, to work for uh, almost no wages uh, and uh, stayed there for generations. So slavery really didn't end. Uh, when many people think that slavery ended. Uh, another way that uh, Congress considered uh, trying to pay some form of reparations was which, with the passage of the Homestead Act of 1862, uh, but that quickly turned and, and all of the benefits, literally 99% of the benefits went to uh, white Americans uh, and also immigrants from Europe. And essentially uh, hundreds of millions of acres uh, were given out to help settle the uh, middle part uh, of the country. 
Uh, and this was the greatest generator of wealth in United States history. Uh, each family was granted 160 acres. Some of this was turned into businesses, farms, et cetera. But again, uh, the African-American community uh, was shut out of this 270 million acres of government land that was distributed. Another opportunity that the United States government had to uh, try to make things right uh, was with the New Deal legislation that I'm sure many of you have heard about. It was the way that uh, the United States government uh, following World War II tried to uh, shore up the middle class. So one of those was the GI Bill, the other being Social Security. Uh, and, and essentially for soldiers who put their lives on the line for this country, uh, they were given an opportunity to build wealth and join the middle class. There were 1.2 million Black veterans uh, following World War II. There were also millions of Asian veterans and Hispanic veterans and Native American veterans who put their lives on the line for this country. Uh, and the benefits of this program uh, were um, college tuition paid for for the veterans and their children, small business loans, low cost loans guaranteed by the US government to buy homes, unemployment insurance, uh, just a way to really get started. Unfortunately, this was specifically denied to people of color, specifically denied to black veterans. And so if you just reflect back to those 1.2 million black veterans who put their lives on the line for this country, where would they have been if they had been able to take advantage of this program and all 1.2 million, those who wanted to, get a college education and all of their children paid for by the US government. Just imagine uh, what type of uh, uh, impact that would have had, been able to become home homeowners by having uh, loans that were guaranteed by the US government. But of course, uh, that was all denied. Social security, uh, which is really the safety net for our elderly population, uh, also uh, excluded 60% of blacks across the United States because of the way it was administered. Uh, and 75% uh, of Blacks in Southern states were denied the opportunity to take advantage of Social Security. Remember, their tax dollars paid for it. They paid into Social Security, just like everybody else. They paid for that GI Bill like everyone else, uh, but were denied the opportunity uh, to take advantage of it. One other factor that I think is really important for folks to understand are the massacres. And this is where we're gonna turn back to California and we'll get into the more current discussion. There were numerous massacres that occurred, uh, not just sort of the more popular ones that movies have been made of, uh, but by my count, more than 30 massacres in the United States of America where entire black communities were completely destroyed. Uh, all the homes burned down, all the businesses burned down, all the churches burned down, uh, all the hospitals burned down, uh, everything. The schools completely destroyed uh, by mobs who were not happy to see middle class Black people thriving in spite of uh, discrimination. Uh, and there has never been any justice for these, these communities um, and after their homes and businesses and everything was burned down, they did not get to return to start over again. Uh, it was taken over uh, by the mobs who forced them out. Uh, so examples of this is Tulsa in 1921, uh, Chicago in 1919. Again, entire Black neighborhoods, communities, everything destroyed. All the wealth that could have been passed down destroyed forever. Springfield, 1908, East St. Louis, 1917, Vicksburg. And I wish I could go into all of the details. These were whole communities of hundreds of thousands of people whose lives were destroyed. Slocum, 1910, Colfax, 1873, Opelousas, 1868, uh, Thibodeau, uh, Memphis, Elaine, Clinton. Again, entire Black communities, the churches, the businesses, the stores, everything wiped out and all of that wealth taken away forever. And we go on and on uh, with all of these examples. And this is not taught in schools. This is not something that people understand. Uh, but just imagine if in spite of all of the Jim Crow segregation, if they had been able to preserve the wealth and just pass it down to their children, where the African-American community would be. 
Similar things happened in California. This was not just a Southern uh, problem. Uh, there was uh, circumstances right here in California. Uh, one example is uh, Allensworth. It was a, a black community that was completely destroyed uh, by uh, segregation and uh, discrimination. I'm gonna quickly go through these others uh, so that I can pass the mic here. I wanted to also touch on the story of the great Charlotte L. Brown. 100 years before Rosa Parks, Charlotte L. Brown helped to desegregate uh, the cable cars uh, in San Francisco. Uh, she was a black woman. Her father was a doctor. She was trying to get to an appointment. She was kicked off because of the color of her skin. She refused. She was arrested. And she, through her efforts, uh, desegregated uh, the public transportation system in California. Uh, so we're now in baseball season. I'm wearing my Giants tie, which probably upsets a few people. It's okay. Um, in Los Angeles, of course, um, going all the way back to the 1950s, uh, when the uh, Dodgers were relocating to Los Angeles, uh, they needed a place to build a stadium. And so they started looking all over, trying to find suitable land for stadium. And they decided they were going to target one of the poorest areas in uh, California, in Southern California, which was Chavez Ravine. It was a heavily Latino populated area. Uh, I had family members who lived in this area uh, during the time. And uh, essentially, they used police force to force uh, the Hispanic community out uh, of their homes. And this is a picture showing uh, a family being forcibly removed. This was during a time where people of color couldn't testify against whites. They had no access to the court system. Uh, and so there were lawyers who came to their defense who tried to stop this, uh, but it went absolutely nowhere. Uh, and these are just examples here. Uh, 1959, uh, you had the Hispanics, you had Black people saying, we're not going anywhere. And this is just one example of how eminent domain has been used in California and all throughout uh, the country to force people of color out of their areas, whether it's to build a new freeway or, or something else. Uh, and so you have uh, these uh, wonderful people who were forced out. This is what it looked like before there was a Dodger Stadium, just a beautiful part of Southern California and, and just forced out uh, at gunpoint. And this one always gets me a little bit choked up. Uh, this here is a story of a gentleman named Cruz uh, uh, Cabral, uh, who is pictured here with his aunt. He was wounded four times uh, in battles fighting for our freedom here in the United States of America. Uh, and he had a home in Chavez Ravine. He refused to sell for the pennies he was offered. Uh, and he uh, had his home bulldozed and he got nothing for it. And the thousands of Hispanics and Black folks who live there have never been compensated by the Los Angeles Dodgers or by uh, Los Angeles County for having their whole lives destroyed, homes bulldozed to the ground. It was just devastating. Here's another example of a family who had their homes destroyed uh, as a result of uh, this unjust eminent domain. And of course, they went ahead and built Dodger Stadium, even though I'm not a Dodger fan, it is a beautiful stadium, uh, but those families could not pass on their wealth uh, to the next generation, completely devastated and destroyed. Uh, so this is just a small example uh, of the uncomfortable history that we have in California. Um, and, and these are still issues that we are struggling with uh, today. Um, and I'll just say this briefly so I can pass uh, the mic. We need all of you, all of the students there in Santa Clara. We need your voices to help preserve our history, to help preserve our right to be able to share this information. They can't do this in much of the country. Uh, they're facing uh, arrests. They're facing the loss of their jobs, their livelihoods. Uh, and we need you to be willing to fight for justice. Our fight is not over. Uh, and I'm so grateful again to the wonderful people there at Santa Clara Law School for making this possible. Uh, I will pass the mic. The other slides are available. And thank you again for the opportunity just to create some historical context of how we got to where we are today.
um, from the students who walked in, you know, the first speaker, uh, Mr. Evans, thank you. Always insightful, always detailed, and more importantly, always powerful. So we, this community really appreciates it. And now uh, Esther O'Connell is going to speak. Uh, she's a policy liaison and staff attorney at the NCP. I am. Um... It's kind of hard to follow up with that. Uh, you have this deep, ugly, horrific history in our country. And as Terrence just said, you all here can play a significant role in us finally doing what the law I'm gonna to talk to you about was designed to do, which is confront racism. It's ironic that um, Terrence started with how they're stopping these conversations in children's schools. My children are young, but they're stopping this in, in numerous states throughout the country that we don't even have space to talk about this stuff anymore. And so at a minimum, Terrence, what you just highlighted for me is that the RJA at least gives us space in our courtrooms as lawyers to actually talk about this. We can't hide from it anymore. There is a law in the state of California where the only one in the country, in the entire country, North Carolina had it in 2009 and it got repealed with a shift in their legislature four years later. So we're the only ones. And I'm not hearing of any traction in other states, maybe Massachusetts, of doing this, but we get to talk about it. So what does it look like so there's an assembly member who is, you're in his district, it's assembly member Ashkara, who was a Santa Clara County public defender, who in May of 2020 had a transportation bill pending in our legislature, transportation bill. And then George Floyd was murdered on May 25th, 2020. July, things take time sometimes in the legislature. July, it's two months later. Ashkara, excuse me, Ashkara gutted his bill, his transportation bill, and turned it into the Racial Justice Act, like that, because he could see the momentum in our country to get this thing passed. And he has, he made sure the preamble made very clear what the goal was of the Racial Justice Act, if it wasn't by name only. Discrimination in our criminal justice system based on race, ethnicity, or national origin has a deleterious effect, not only on individual criminal defendants, but on our system of justice as a whole. The United States Supreme Court has recognized the impact of evidence of racial bias cannot be measured simply by how much airtime it received at a trial or how many pages it occupies in a record. Some toxins can be deadly in small doses. Discrimination undermines public confidence in our system. And the intent of the legislature, not just the intent of Assemblymember Ashkara, but the intent of the legislature was to ensure that race plays no role at all in seeking or obtaining convictions or in sentencing. It is the intent of the legislature to reject the conclusion that racial disparities within our criminal justice system are inevitable and to actively work to eradicate them. So this wasn't just about giving space, although I'm grateful today to say that it at least is doing that. At a minimum, it gives us space to talk about it. But the law was so much bigger than that. We want to confront it and get rid of it. That's going to take time. And that's why having students and professors who give us the opportunity to talk about it here, because we're going to be the ones that are going to be fighting this for years and years until we actually do what this law intends to do. And I feel confident that unlike North Carolina, ours will stay in California. And I hope that other states follow suit. Parents actually inspired me to, to skip over a lot of this, because I want to talk to you a little bit about what he has teed up here. But before I do that, I want to just highlight what the claims are in the Racial Justice Act. We um, at North, why am I here talking to you about this? This is why. I've been a longtime attorney with the Northern California Innocence Project. If you go to any Innocence Network conference, we go to next week, actually. It is exonerees throughout the entire country. 
And if you want to see a sign of the racial disparities and the racism in our criminal legal system, you look at a stage of men and women who have been exonerated over the last 40 years, and a majority of them are black and brown. This is something that impacts our work daily. And we were very fortunate that when the RJA passed, we were asked to join an implementation group. So every other week, I am talking about the Racial Justice Act. I have students from Santa Clara Law who are helping research issues in the law to help litigators to breathe life into this act. I encourage any of you, come talk to me. There's so much work we have to do with this law because it is grand and, it's, and we're getting battles in court, but we're talking about this stuff. But that's how our office has been involved in it. So there are four claims. The first is that a judge, juror, expert witness, law enforcement officer or attorney exhibited bias uh, or animus towards the defendant because of the defendant's race, ethnicity, or national origin. The second being that a judge, juror, same individuals, prosecutor, defense attorney, law enforcement, expert witness, used racially coded or discriminatory language or otherwise exhibited animus towards the defendant in court, in trial, based on their race, ethnicity, or national origin. And then the A3 and A4 claims in the RJA address disparities, recognizing that certain races are um, sentenced or charged or convicted disparately to other races of individuals who are similarly situated. So when this law was drafted, it was intended to account for every place in our system that could demonstrate where race, racism impacts it. Right now, or excuse me, up until January 1 of 2023, the law only applied to people who were convicted or there was a final judgment as of January 1, 2021. What is wrong with that? The law only applied to individuals who achieved final judgment after January 1, 2021. Just say it. What is wrong with that? We just went through 500 years of history in our country. Race, go ahead, Savannah. Around 2021. That's right. Racism did not start in our country in January 2021. Why did the law say that then? Why did it only apply to those people? Um, place a large burden on the legal system to try and, you know, do all their due diligence or let go. There you go. It came down to money. It came down to money. Do you know what this opens the door to? A lot. A lot. And so when the fight was happening to get this law passed, we had to be smart about it. Get the law passed. Get the law passed first. Have it apply to those convicted after January 1, 2021. And guess what happened the following year? Assembly member Kalra sponsored, authored another bill, AB 256, which was called the Racial Justice Act for All, RJA 2.0. And what that did was have it run retroactive, but it's a phased retroactivity. So as I stand here today, it now applies to everyone convicted after January 1, 2021 and to all individuals sentenced to capital punishment or who have or the potential to have immigration consequences. Next year, January 2024, the law will apply to our clients. Anyone who is incarcerated, anyone who's incarcerated, regardless of when they were convicted. 2025, it's anyone regardless, regardless of custodial status who had been convicted as of January 2015. And in January 2026, it will apply to anyone who's been convicted of a felony in the state of California. Pretty amazing, right? Pretty amazing. We just had to be patient. And we had to take some punches on the way. I might not have time to talk about them. I might leave you with it to just think about as you leave here today. That's the, the catch that I highlight here. I might get to it. But I want to go through this rather quickly because I want to get to the place where parents left off. So as you can see, exhibited bias or animus towards the defendant. 
the key words here is demonstrating that the animus was towards a defendant, which is going to be difficult to establish. But there was this case out of Massachusetts, again, a state that doesn't have the Racial Justice Act. And it was a young woman who identified as Asian who was being prosecuted for murdering her parents in a fire that they argued she started. In During the trial, the defense attorney is heard talking about um, the prosecutors in the case saying things that were uh, racist about Frances Choi, who was the young woman being prosecuted and, and actually was convicted of killing her parents. They got discovery on several emails that demonstrated all of this racism directly pointing towards Frances Choi and her race, memes, illustrations, comments, just horrific demonstrations of racism. But they didn't have the RJA. So what could they do with it? What do you do when you don't have the Racial Justice Act as a platform to do this? What do you say? What objection do you make when you say there's something that's compromised the integrity of a conviction? What do I turn to instead? Constitution. I'm going to the Constitution. I'm specifically going to the Due Process Clause. I'm guaranteed a fair trial. And when there's racism, there is not a fair trial. And she won. And she won. And she got to come home after being wrongfully convicted because of the racism. And the court found that the racism was a structural violation. You could not believe in the integrity of the case any longer because of the way. And, and guess what? The jurors never heard this evidence. This evidence never got before the jury. But the court found that the racism that was exhibited by the prosecutors who prosecuted this woman, we could not have confidence in that prosecution. That deprived her of the right to due process. So they set the stage for claims like this over in Massachusetts. The next one, the big distinction here is one, we're recognizing that there is racially coded, racially discriminatory language. That is something we are battling in the courts on what this means and and how would somebody know if something is racially discriminatory or, or racially coded and also again it has to be in court so this has to be heard by your jury it has to be during court proceedings again i'm going to just jump through some of these things so one thing i'm going to hit pause here for these A1 and A2 claims, the, the racial animus exhibited towards and then in court, the reason why I said there was a catch on the retroactivity is because in order to get it to run retroactive to everyone in the state of California, eventually all A1 and A2 claims that run retroactively have this attached to it. It's akin to a harmless error standard, which basically says I'm entitled to relief unless the prosecution can establish beyond a reasonable doubt that the racism did not contribute to the outcome of my trial. What is wrong with that? Anyone kind of gets sick reading that? Why? Say it in a sentence. The racism was harmless in this case. Say it again, Jason. There you go, right? When can we ever say that racism in a case is harmless to a case? You can't. This was really tough to take, and we had many conversations, but this was the only way we could get the law passed. And this is intended on being really a standard that the prosecution cannot meet, right? How can you untangle racism from a case? And that's what they were, would be required to do but we're gonna face a lot of litigation on this and it's yet to come. And then the three and four claims, this is where I want to talk to you. Um, and I'll actually go off um, the PowerPoint. Oops, sorry, there's... Um, with the racial disparities, when those laws were first, when those claims were first passed, how do you demonstrate racial disparities? How do you demonstrate one group of people get harsher sentences, harsher convictions, harsher charges than another group of people of a different race. What, what would you turn to? Some form of statistics. Statistics. Oh, 
Okay, different aspects of life. Statistics, yeah. When the law first passed, it highlighted data. We need data on this. We need people to look at data, look at individuals being prosecuted of the defendant's race and compare it to other races, and that would reveal the disparity. And yet we have never won one of these claims yet. We have not won them. And what inspired the law was a case, McCleskey, in which they did have a, the data. They had the data that showed the racial disparities when it came to imposing the death penalty. And the court said that's not enough without intentional discrimination. Well, guess what? We put in the Racial Justice Act, intentional discrimination is not required. We're not talking about somebody acting racist or, or being racist. And we're talking about the institution of racism in our system, which does not require us to demonstrate intentionality in any way. But what we did and what I appreciate so much on what Terrence just did is there will be space for Terrence to come into court and testify about this history. Because one of the most recent amendments to the RJA was in demonstrating disparities, we don't need to just rely on statistics. We get to tell the story of racism in a particular county, in a particular zip code, the policing at schools, all of the things that Terrence just highlighted, this ugly, deep, horrific history, that is the context for this data. That is why this data exists, because this is the, this is the way the disparities have been playing out in the historical context of a particular community. And we now get to tell those stories. And we didn't until, two, until AB 256 got passed. But we recognize that we have to provide the context for the court, the community that the judge is sitting in. What is the history? What are the historical monuments? What is the history of redlining? Just being able to talk about these things to say that is how we know that these are the disparities as they pertain to certain races in a particular jurisdiction. But once courts start identifying that there are racial disparities, what is going to happen? What is going to happen when they say, yes, if that particular race has been disparately sentenced, disparately charged, disparately convicted? What should happen to those cases? Something has to happen to those cases. Yeah, your colleague just said somebody has to take action. There has to be remedies. There has to be rectifying. You can't just say it's there. You got to do something about it. And that's why for the RJA, the hashtag to keep modern, right? The hashtag was confront racism, right? And that is what this act does. And it will continue again as a minimum to give us these spaces in a law school to talk about these things because you're gonna be the way to make sure that this law actually does what it intended to do. You have a champion in profess, uh, excuse me, an assembly member cholera, and he's gonna keep fighting the fight until this law does what it intended to do. But there's gonna there's future legislators in here, jurors, lawyers, judges. We all have to play our part in making sure that this this actually does what it's intended to do. And I realize we're out of time. Just a quick thanks um, to all of you for attending and to these really wonderful speakers. I'm I feel charged up. I'm ready to go out and do something. So thank thank you both so much. It was such an honor and a privilege to hear from both of you. And thank you for sharing all this information with us. So um and thank you so much. So Terrence will sign off and thank you so so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, everyone. Hi, thank you. Um, and so those are the audience. We do have um, lunch back there. If you please help yourselves. Yeah.